We're going to have a guest speaker this morning. Really, he's not a guest, but Jeff Trott is one of our elders here, but he's also one of our teachers here, and he has, uh, since retirement, said that he would step into a teaching rotation with myself and a couple other gentlemen here in the church. So but now I'm going to hand it over to Jeff Trott. Yeah, and I get to do this after my wife gives that testimony. How about that? So <laughs> um, Austin is up front here. If anybody didn't get an outline insert, I'd appreciate you grab one from him. If you need a pen, he's got pens as well, I think, available if somebody needs those. If I'm smiling more than normal today, I'll tell you it's because I have the privilege of preaching. And not only do I have the privilege of preaching, but I get to preach on a Christmas story today. Some of you may remember a Sunday school class for the adults we offered about three years ago where we took a very in-depth look at the Christmas story. Some of you may remember a message I shared a while ago on uh, the proper response to Christmas. And I'm sure in both those times I shared just how much I love studying and being in the Christmas story as it's recorded in the Bible. It's truly a fascinating record of the events surrounding the earthly birth of Jesus. And the more you dig, the more you uncover, the more you appreciate what is in that story. I love having the chance to preach and teach on that. Now, earlier in the week, a Pastor Dave sent a... Uh, <laughs> sorry, you're running. Pastor Dave sent a text out to those that were involved in the service today. And uh, I think one of the gentlemen that got the text had looked down and saw that I was giving the message today. So he was prompted to respond this to the text. So that's why that's up there today. But I think what the good news is, is that uh, this message today is going to be substantially shorter than I normally. I tend to wax eloquent. I know that. I go on for a while. But today we shouldn't see a whole lot of that head nodding, I don't think. So here we are. We're in work th week three of Advent. Advent, the season where we are focusing on and preparing ourselves for Christmas. In week one, you'll remember, uh, we looked at the need of a Savior, where Pastor Dave very clearly and um, uh, indisputably gave us ten reasons why, according to the Bible, on our own, we are not acceptable to God because of our sin. And then last week in week two, we looked at the promise of a Savior, where Pastor Dave taught on one of the many Old Testament passages where God promises to offer a remedy for the sin problem in mankind by sending a Savior. And then here we are today, week three, we're looking at, as Pastor Dave referenced earlier, the announcement of a Savior. Now, the announcement of a Savior is the, this is the fun one. This is where we actually get to get into the Christmas story itself, dig into it and see what's there. The announcement of a Savior is the theme for this week. But the actual title of today's sermon is The Peace, Peace. Now, I didn't stutter. If you look at your outline insert or maybe even up on the screen, you'll see that I used two words that sound identically the same but they have different meanings. Peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, and peace, P-I-E-C-E. -E. The end of the passage we will be looking at today alludes to peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, and who can really have this peace. We will determine what the required and necessary peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, of God's plan, if you will, is needed to have and possess true and lasting peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, with God. And if you stay tuned in with me and follow along, by the end of this message today, everyone here will be able to understand what that peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, is. And if you would, before we go any further, please join me for prayer. Let's ask for God's blessing on this time. Our Father and our God, this truly is a sacred time when we come together as your sons and daughters and we approach you and we look into your word and we attempt to understand what it is that you're saying through your word. We look to you, God, for everything that goes on here during this message. We pray, Lord, that you will open our, our hearts and our minds 
and our spirits to what it is that you would have us take away from this message today. And as always, Lord, it's in the glorious name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles, if you have them with you, to Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 through 14. If you don't have your Bible with you, we'll have the verses on the screen. And if you have the handheld devices, I am preaching again from the NIV edition, 1984. I am limiting myself to just seven verses today for reason of focus and to a certain extent time as well. And I do have to say, this is really tough for me. This is difficult because, again, there is so much in this Christmas story. There's absolutely so much great information. But again, I am going to force myself. um, I'm going to limit it to just the seven verses. And I understand that Luke, I think it's 137, tells us that all things are possible with God. So I think we can do that. I think we can do just the seven verses. Now, this narrative is a great example, perhaps one of the very best, of the benefit of putting yourself in the scene. It's not just reading the verses, but actually imagining yourself there in the story, being affected by it and taking it in just as those who were there did. This approach will give you a much greater understanding of and appreciation for what took place. So follow along with me, if you will. Luke 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. So if you look at your outline, you look at number one there, we are setting the scene here in verse 8. Setting the scene. And by the way, somebody mentioned to me, sometimes with an outline there tends to be a little bit of uh, tenseness, wondering, oh, I don't want to miss the next thing. I will tell you when to fill in the blanks. So don't be worrying about that. I'll point those out to you as we go through them. Now, where does this passage fit into the Christmas story chronologically? You'll probably remember that back in Luke 1.26, Gabriel appears to Mary and predicts the virgin birth of Jesus. Then if we move to Matthew 1, beginning at verse 18, an angel appears to Joseph in a dream to reassure him Mary has not been unfaithful. Then chronologically, again, the story moves into the beginning part of this chapter, Luke 2, the first seven verses, and it records the census decree made by Caesar Augustus. Joseph and a very pregnant Mary traveled to Bethlehem. The actual long-awaited earthly birth of Jesus, the Messiah, takes place. So that's what's happened so far in the Christmas story. And that brings us up to this passage we just read. We are right about the halfway point of what is typically considered the Christmas story. So let's unpack this. Let's look a little deeper at this passage we just read and see what we can uncover what's there. Back to verse 8, if you would. And there were shepherds. Stop there. The first people to hear about the birth of Messiah were lowly shepherds. And I say they were lowly shepherds because in that day and age, Not in God's eyes, but in society's eyes, shepherds were on the bottom rung of the societal ladder. They had no real meaning in most people's eyes. So they were the lowest of the low. And I couldn't help but make the connection when we were watching that video at the beginning of the service. The lepers today in that city in India 
are probably considered the same way in that society. Again, not in God's eyes, but in that society. But it is the lowly shepherds that first heard of this miraculous birth. It wasn't the kings and the princes. It wasn't the religious leaders. But it was the lowly shepherds that first got to hear this great news. These shepherds, it says, were living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now, up to this point, this is just a normal night for the shepherds. They're just doing their shepherding thing. Nothing out of the ordinary so far. It's interesting that Luke includes the words at night, too. That's one nice little clue there, too, as you're putting yourself into these verses to see. To just keep that in the back of your mind. Everything's dark around you right now. Now, two on your outline, it says an angelic appearance. An angelic appearance. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Stop there. All of a sudden, this is no longer a normal night for the shepherds. This is not a common event. I know there's a few appearances, I think four. I didn't actually go back and count them all, but I think there's four appearances of angels grouped around the Christmas story. But other than that, an angelic appearance is not an everyday or common kind of a thing. And the glory of the Lord shone shone around them. Now imagine this. Not only have you seen an angel, but this glory of the Lord would typically manifest itself in brilliant light. So you're out there in the fields. You're surrounded by... You might have your uh, campfire going or something like that, but mostly it's dark. And all of a sudden, there's this brilliant light comes out of nowhere, and here's an angel. And it says, and they were terrified. Literally, they feared a great fear. You bet. Their typical dark night was now shattered with blazing, maybe blinding light. The fear we see here in the shepherds is a common response by people who have been visited by angels in the Bible. Then at verse 10, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. This too is a common response by angels to people who have been frightened by a visit from an angel. You can almost imagine the shepherds now saying, Okay, Mr. Angel, that's easy for you to say, Why shouldn't we be afraid? The angel says, Because I bring you good news of great joy. This is not a bad thing. This is nothing to be afraid of here. He goes on and says that will be for all the people. This good news is not just for the shepherds. It's not just for the Jews. It's not... It's not, for, it's not limited to anybody. It's for all people. Lepers, kings, foreigners, your neighbors. It's for all people. Three on your, on your outline there is announcing the arrival. Announcing the arrival. Today, these verses just kind of probably ring in your head because... We hear them at Christmas time, and it's, it's just great stuff. Today, in the town of David, this is a reference to Bethlehem. Israel's greatest king, King David, came from Bethlehem. And hence, that's where, call it a nickname, if you would, for Bethlehem, because he came from there. Hundreds of years before Jesus' earthly birth, the prophet Micah, in chapter 5, verse 2, had prophesied that when Messiah did come, he would come from Bethlehem. And indeed, as we see here and earlier in Luke chapter 2, he did. He fulfilled that prophecy and every other one written about him. And this is one of the things that gets me so excited. There are some, I don't know, 340 or 50 or some prophecies in the Old Testament referring to the coming of this Messiah. And Jesus fulfilled every one of them. They're not all predicting things around the Christmas story, but throughout his life, he fulfilled every one of those prophecies. Didn't miss one. And he fulfills the Christmas prophecies, of course, as well. 
A Savior has been born to you. At long last, the promised Savior has come. And again, he comes not just to the shepherds and not just to the Jews, but he comes to everyone. That's a Christmas gift I can get excited about. Now let's look at the word Savior. I wanted to look up the definition of Savior in the dictionary according to Webster's New World Dictionary, Second College Edition. The definition of Savior is, quote, a person who saves, unquote. Not a lot of help there. A person who saves. It did, interesting enough, it did give two examples. Number one was God, and number two was Jesus Christ. I found that interesting that that was in this in the dictionary, but uh, included in that. So, Now, implied in the word Savior is the need to be saved from something. Now, think for a moment. I don't want you to say it out loud, but just think for a moment. From what is it that mankind needs to be saved? From what is it that mankind needs to be saved? Now, according to Romans 5, 9, it is the wrath of God. That verse reads, since we have now been justified by his, Jesus' blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Yes, one could argue that we need to be saved from our sins, and some of you were probably thinking of that when I asked you. But sin only, I don't like to use the word only here, but I couldn't come up with anything else. Sin only causes us to have to face God's wrath. And in the final judgment, judgment, it is God's wrath that sends the unrepentant and unsaved person to hell. Remember, though, it is God himself who provides the Savior for anyone and everyone who will believe in him and in his work and ministry. Now back to the end of verse 11. He is Christ. The word Christ here is not a name, but it's an exalted title. Christ, here in the Greek, is identical to the Hebrew word Messiah. They're interchangeable. They both mean the anointed one, which, according to Dr. John MacArthur, means, quote, one placed in a high office and worthy of exaltation and honor, unquote. Of special interest to the Jews, this angel is announcing that the long-awaited and highly anticipated arrival of Messiah has finally taken place. After literally centuries of waiting, Messiah has finally come to the nation of Israel. And you can imagine how excited the shepherds were to be hearing this information. Not only is Jesus the Christ or Messiah, according to this verse, he is also the Lord. As used here, Lord, kurios, is a divine title and is indicating that this baby is God. This baby is God. The last five words of this verse, he is Christ the Lord, are full of significance and deep meaning. Now going to four on your outline. Significance of the sign. Significance of the sign. Verse 12, this will be a sign to you. Literally, in the Greek, it's the sign. That's why I included that on your outline there. This will be the sign to you. And the angel says, you will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. A baby wrapped in claws is nothing special. All babies were wrapped in claws. But finding one lying in a manger, that would be very strange and out of the ordinary. Now, the significance of the sign is this. And try and stay with me on this. The angel predicts or prophesies that, one, the shepherds will go look for a baby. Two, they will find the baby. And three, they will find him in a manger. 
And when the shepherds hurry off in verse 16, that follows our passage. We're not going to get into that today. When they hurry off and do find the baby lying in a manger, this confirms the angel's credibility and gives substance and authenticity to the other facts he presents regarding this baby in the manger, that he is Savior, he's the Savior, that he is Messiah, that he is the Lord, that he is God, that little baby is God. Sorry. If it gives the angel, if you will, in today's vernacular, it gives him street cred, or maybe more accurate here, field cred. Although the nighttime appearance of an angel accompanied by the dazzling glory of the Lord was probably enough to make the angel's remarks believable and trustworthy. Now, as a side note, we also saw in this verse the word manger. And manger here is the only clue the Bible gives us as to whether Jesus was born in a stable or in a cave or perhaps even just in the middle of a field. Anything beyond manger is all speculation. Number five on your outline, the heavenly host. The heavenly host, H-O-S-T. This is verse 13. Just in case the shepherds needed any additional convincing, we come to verse 13. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, stop there. Revelation 5 verse 11 seems to indicate that there are more and maybe substantially more to get this 100 million angels. That's a lot. We don't know how many were dispatched to be present at this event, but the phrase, a great company of the heavenly host, signifies a large group. This phrase also indicates a military encampment. This is an army of angels. He goes on, or the text goes on and says, appeared with the angel. Now picture this. All of a sudden, everywhere the shepherds looked, they saw that they were surrounded by this mighty army of angels. Anywhere they looked, they saw angels all around them. This is a first-time event, by the way. There were so many angels appearing at once is unprecedented in Scripture. And what are the angels doing? They're praising God and saying. Now, imagine the sound. Imagine the amount of sound produced by all of these angels. This would be surround sound to the max, if you will, but just tremendous sound. And again, I'm not trying to ruin any of your Christmas carols, your Christmas cards, but the the verse says that the angels were saying, not singing. We've got carols that say, and the angels were singing, and so on and so forth. Technically, the text says they were saying. Now, six, we're pretty much on the last part of your outline there. Six is the proclamation of peace. Peace, P-E-A-C-E, the proclamation of peace. And this is in verse 14. Now, to start with, please understand that the use of the word men here refers to both males and females. And it's really important to realize this. This verse, verse 14, can be a little hard to understand correctly, but I think, I think we can get through it and figure it out. Verse 14 says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. The first part of this verse is straightforward. The angels are giving glory to God, who is in the highest, which is heaven. This is the Gloria in excelsis Deo, if you've ever heard that phrase. Part of the chorus is out of Handel's Oratorio, Messiah, so on. That's what they're referring to here. Now, the difficulty comes with the last part. What does the Bible mean when it says, Peace to men on whom his favor rests? What is this peace, and how does one obtain it? I think a large part of the problem with misunderstanding what is being said here is the way that the King James Version translates the end of this verse. I'm not knocking the King James Version. 
It's been a decent translation and in use for 400 years. But languages change over time. For example, and I remember hearing R.C. Sproul teach on this in one of his teaching things that I have at home. Today, we all know what the word cute means. C-U-T-E, cute. It's a positive, flattering word. It's a compliment. The same word used back in the time of Elizabethan England, which is when the King James Version was translated, meant that you were bow-legged. You were bow-legged. See the problem? See how languages have changed over time? It seems that the King James Version of this verse is what we've been exposed to the most and what's been used in most Christmas cards and most Christmas carols for generations. We received one this week. In front of the card said, Peace on Earth. Got that one this week. But listen as I read how the King James Version translates this verse, and you can see how it may be misleading. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. No problem with the first half, it's the same. But the second half of the King James Version of this verse seems to be less directed to specific individuals and more of a generalized request for mankind to strive for peace on earth and to demonstrate goodwill toward each other. This presents peace as something that's man-initiated, that comes from man and is given to all. But when compared to the better translations available today, this understanding and interpretation seems to fall short. Now, in fairness, the New King James Version translates the last part of this verse exactly as the King James Version does. But the ESB, the NASB, and the NLT all end the verse with peace among men or those with whom he, God, is pleased. Adding to that the NIV's peace to men or those on whom his favor rests, it seems that there is more to this verse than what the King James Version is indicating. This peace, P-E-A-C-E, comes from God, not from man. And this peace is not universal. It's not granted to everyone but only to those with whom God is pleased and on whom his favor rests. So, the question, how do we become those with whom God is pleased and on whom his favor rests? And how do we get this peace, P-E-A-C-E, that comes from God? What is that necessary peace, P-I-E, C-E, of God's plan from which we can receive peace, P-E-A-C-E, from God. Here's the answer. And you can fill this in on the very bottom of your outline here. The answer, uh, it it is authentic and genuine faith and belief in the person, work, and ministry of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'll say it again. It is the authentic and genuine faith and belief in the person, work, and ministry of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord, Jesus Christ. Acts 10 36 says, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. With regard to pleasing God, the writer of Hebrew tells us that, again, we must have faith, and it's impossible to please God without it. Hebrews 11, verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This Savior 
entered the world as a tiny little helpless baby. And yet his coming brought ramifications for all of eternity. This struck me this week as I was working on this. Most babies get changed. This baby changed everything. Mankind was created to live at peace with God. But Adam and Eve's sin ruined it for everyone because everyone has inherited their sin nature. And this sin nature that we all have separates us from God because it causes us to sin. Pastor Dave alluded to this verse last week in his message. Isaiah 59 verse 2, it says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. When we are separated from God, we have no relationship with him. And consequently, we have no peace. This situation can be summed up in four words. No God, no peace. However, God had promised a remedy for mankind's sin problem. And he fulfilled that promise by sending his son into the world to be the savior of mankind. We are reminded of that every time we hear the name Jesus. Because Jesus means the Lord saves. Authentic and genuine faith and belief in the person, work, and ministry of our Savior Jesus Christ, the peace peace, is what allows us to enter into a relationship with God the Father and receive his peace. And this peace from God is what gives us peace with God. This too can be summed up in four words. No God, no peace. I'm sure just about everybody here knows that President George H.W. Bush, known as 41, passed away a little over a week ago. It was made evident during the coverage of his funeral that President Bush was a man of deep Christian faith. James Baker, President Bush's Secretary of State and also his dear and perhaps his closest friend, visited 41 on the morning of his last day here on earth. I'm paraphrasing. As Secretary Baker approached President Bush, the president asked, Where are we going today, Bake? To heaven, the secretary answered. I'd like that, the president said. It appears that our 41st president had no reason to fear death and that he had obtained peace with God. Wouldn't you like to have that same peace? Wouldn't you like to be able to go through life knowing for certain that you had peace with God? That when you lay down in your bed at night, you can sleep in heavenly peace, as the song we sang referred to? Because you know whether you wake or not. You are right with God. Wouldn't you like to have that peace? And that peace is not just for end time situations. You'll uh, allow me to be a little vulnerable today. This year has been a tough year for our family. We lost my brother to pancreatic cancer back in June. My mom has been dealing with some pretty severe health issues. And she's now moved into a different chapter of her life. And we've been trying to help her with that and make the right decisions and so on. My wife's been dealing with her heart issue. I was fairly sick for a few weeks here this fall, dealing with an infection 
in my head up here, and then shingles, and then vertigo. So 1918 has been a difficult year for us. It really has. But having peace with God makes all the difference in the world. When you're, when you're going through those trials, and you will. Jesus himself said, when the trials come, not if, when the trials come, we're all going to face them. But having that peace with God, knowing that he is in control, and he knows everything that's going on, and I like to think of the idea, he has the big picture view of everything that's going on all over the earth. And I don't. I don't have his view. But I've learned to trust him. That whatever it is, he's asked us to go through. That he will be there for us. And he will give us the strength to get get through it. I would like to invite anyone who may have questions about what's been said today. Or... Maybe you don't feel that you are at peace with God. Or maybe you aren't absolutely sure where you would spend eternity if you were to die tonight. To come up and speak with Pastor Dave or myself after we end the service in just a couple of minutes. Don't be embarrassed. There's no reason to be embarrassed. But if you have doubts, there's no better time than right now to address them. None of us knows when we're going to die. And I think at the end of the service, I believe Pastor Dave's going to invite anybody that has prayer needs for any other areas to come up over here and meet with our prayer team. But if you have questions about this, what was spoken on today, again, please come up here to see me, see Pastor Dave. Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And let me end the same way Paul ended his second letter to the believers at Thessalonica. Now may the Lord of Peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Amen.